what kind of teams play in the league are there certain strengths and weaknesses to the better in the league in general the players what level are they what are their experience can they even perform your style uh, the team is there any expression in the team when you come there and do you need to change that how much do you need to change that culture the team all the area i think uh, a lot of us are international students and I think for sure that you can say that football is not played the same way in your home country that it is in this country. And an English person would be the exact same who would also go to another country and say this is not played the same way. Not even maybe they played football differently down here the south and maybe they played football differently in the other side of London. It might be also an area like a geographical within the country culture. And culture is something that is hard to to change just from one day to another. The coach, can you even do it yourself? Do you just have a lot of good ideas and, or do you actually know how to implement them? What are your experiences with this style of play? And also facilities plays a big impact. For example, do we want to go and play take a type of football when we play or not? That is also something that impacts your, your style of play. So to give some example of these phases, I'll take you through some of the offensive phases. Here we have the ball and we're looking out for the, the blue team, the, the attacking team. Have the ball in phase one now. We haven't beaten the first line of pressure yet. Oh shit. team is a very patient team waiting for the opportunity especially through the middle now we're going into second phase for a few who have broken the first line of pressure uh, this is a team I work with so I can say this for sure that now uh, you can see this is our 10 he has dropped down because the, the aim of some of the tactical tools we use in our second team is to break through in the middle of the pitch. So that is why we have dropped a lot of players out of the space to attack the space. We have a winner, winger also who has tucked in uh, to be able to attack that space. So these are some things we can say about our principles in phase two. You can see an overlap also coming. And now we go into phase three. How do we want to assist the goals? This is done in this instance by a cutback, which is also a part of, of the style of playing this particular team. So this is an example of how you can split the game into the phases and then what tactical tools do you need to go from one phase to another phase. In the defensive phases, here we're just defending and trying to intercept the ball. Once we want to win the ball centrally, now the ball is passed into the block, we go and start pressure. Now we go into the defend, defending, uh, the intercepting phase, and we end up intercepting the ball. So, now I'll move more into my own style of play, how I want to, to play in these phases. We have to phase one here. In our first phase, we want to be sure to have an overload in, the, in, the, in our first third of the area. That is for one thing to secure the balance into the next phase, or second, uh, or second point in it to attract more uh, opponents, so you can take more opponents out with one pass. And then after that, we uh, will start to work down through our following priorities. Within my teams, we'll often work a lot with priorities or principles. I'll come into principles later, but priorities is first as the center back has the ball. Can he play that's directly into the pocket? He should do that. Is that not possible? Can he just pass the first line of pressure with a pass? Can he not do that? He has to take a pass the first line of pressure himself. Is he not comfortable with doing that? Or is it not possible? Then we want to circulate the ball towards the furthest sideline, not the closest, because if he plays it in there, we'll just get trapped. And so work down. Uh, after that, we go into some more long diagonal balls, passes into the back space of hitting the man closest to, the, to our the teammate closest to goal. 
So this, this is the way I work with our phase one play a lot of priorities, say how do we, if we can't do this, we do that, if we can't do this, we do that. Uh, and this is of course suited to the players that are available and also your own thoughts about football also laid out, explain it into the system. The second phase, the creation phase, that is when we have passed the first line of pressure, then we start to, to play according to principles and not priorities. We have a principle that says white players will often tuck in centrally to create an overload in the central areas or the half spaces, which would be this space. Uh, we have also a principle that says often, uh, the teammate with facing goal with no pressure on that should release at least two deep runs uh, in behind. That doesn't necessarily mean he has to play the ball because the deep runs can also create the space to keep playing inside. Uh, the, the run should be diagonal instead of vertical. Uh, if we can't break through the middle, then off ball backs are the ones re responsible for attacking the wings. And also, uh, we want to play a lot on the blind side of the opponent. We want to, when they can press us in the miss, we, we need to exploit, exploit these blind sides. These are some basic principles that I, that I coach and uh, maybe not that difficult to coach, I think, but it can be fitted into every system. That is the point of the style of play and not the system. This can be fitted into a 4-4-2, 4-2-3-1, uh, depending on how you play that uh, system. Phase three, before going into what exactly we do in a phase three, I think there are three, uh, there are six key factors in how to create a chance. Uh, we want to have chances of big quality. We don't want to shoot a lot from distance. We don't want to shoot a lot with the, with a lot of players between the goal and the, the shooter. So we, all, we have to, before deciding how we get uh, uh, come to a chance, we need to, to see how can we facilitate these factors with just the distance to goal, the angle to goal, the pressure on the shooting player, the shot type, the shot assist, and the number of players between shooting player and the goal. So for example, if I want to shoot the ball towards Skewland, he's the goal. It doesn't matter how many players are there, but it doesn't matter how many players are between me and Julian. So, to facilitate these factors, as I've written here, if we can play a flat through ball centrally, as seen here, which is obviously very hard to do, it's not a thing that occurs that, that uh, often, that is our first priority. And here we're going to work with priorities again, because our first priority will obviously create, create a bigger chance than our second priority, which will be a flat, flat through ball further out. Uh, in, in the half spaces and then work down and you can read them yourself. Uh, when it comes to creating from from the sides, uh, if we can't break through the middle, we want to create by the fullbacks because as seen in our phase one, not our phase two, our play our white players will be inside the pitch. So obviously you cannot start to make a phase three strategy where you say uh, we want our white our wingers to stay wide and do crosses because that doesn't correlate with your with your phase two plan. So here we have taken that into consideration and said if we can do that, we want the fullbacks to be the one crossing the ball and the wingers to run into the area as well. We want the crosses to be flat and hard and uh, preferably first time cross. Uh, that is done to and between the goalkeeper and the defender. Uh, the first first. The time cross is basically because then you will have the defending team also running towards the goal uh, and a flat ball because they are harder to clear and that could end up in an own goal, for example. Like, there's not as necessarily your own player who scores that goal. See, for example, the goal I think was Phil Jones who made an own goal against Tottenham not that long ago, where you have that exact thing. The ball comes from, from the central, goes out wide, first time cross inside. Phil Jones runs towards the ball, but that's nothing you can do about it. Just Choose it into some goal. So that is something I consider very important when I plan my phases in phase three. These things: how can we create a bigger quality in, in our chance? 
transitions. Transitions are a bit hard to plan, I find, because you don't always know where the ball is being lost and where the ball is being won, because they're, especially where the ball is being won. This is our defensive transitions in general. We want to win the ball back as high as possible. If that is not possible, we want to either delay the, the opponent whilst we, the remaining defenders, uh, recover in a V shape. If that's not possible, we commit a free kick as uh, early as possible. Um, free kick uh, for myself is something that I think that's an interesting discussion because I hear a lot of people when they are talking about counter attacks or coaching counter attacks, they say, for example, you said yesterday we don't foul people. Uh, and I, I can agree with that, we, we shouldn't foul people, but I think it's an important tool still to have in defending a counter attack that. Because I would rather take a yellow card, or maybe not. If you're committed early enough, it's not even for sure it will be a, a yellow card. I mean, if you go and see, especially Manchester City's um, stats on their their ball recoveries, but also their falls, you will see a lot of their falls are committed in this third because then they, the opposition escapes the counter pressure, and then they will just foul them before it gets too dangerous. They won't get that many cards. I think that's a very understudied thing about football. How can we use the foul, especially in transition phases? Uh, if we can repressure the ball, we want to go into a man-oriented repressure, which is uh, done here. Ball is being lost here. You just go to the nearest man and have to press him, try and win the ball back from that. The defending. Uh, part of the game. This is where we are just not trying to win the ball back. We don't have enough players around the ball to do that. We want to stay very compact as shown in this one, in this slide. We want to man mark the players in centrally. We don't want to give any space because that, then they will try to pass and then they might succeed with that pass. Some people will, some uh, teams will just cover straight lines and and then start to press it when, it's, when the ball is being put in there. But I don't want to risk the pass inside. I just want to man mark them so they're forced to play around, uh, around there. You can see here what we do when they try and switch the ball. We do the same. Even the widest man out here stays inside to just give them a lot of space on the wings, try and tempt them to pass the ball out to the wings. Because that is then in correlation with the intercepting phase. The ball is passed out to the wings. Now we can go and overload the side. Now we can go and try and intercept the ball by the side. Um, the intercepting phase of play, I think, can be separated into two uh, categories. There's both high pressing and then there's intercepting after depending in a lower block. Uh, in general, I will put my teams, I will use these two uh, pressing uh, traps uh, triggers to to press high. This one is the more common one. The ball is playing up, played out to the fullback. Wing, ball by winger goes in to make the team compact. You go man man inside. This has been done by a thousand teams in, in the in the past. Uh, this one is a bit more complicated. Uh, as I showed you before, the team won't ever get to play centrally on against my team. That is my aim at least. But in this particular instance, you then open up the gap on purpose to tempt him, up, to tempt him to think, oh, now I finally have the opportunity to pass inside, then pa passes inside, then we can go in at, uh, if everything works well enough for we be one in centrally. That also gives us the opportunity to start the counter attack and overload because we have already overloaded this player in here. Uh, however, especially the white player here will be uh, have to be uh, conscious about the, the player uh, running his back out here, what, hence why he has to curb his run. Um, also, in my intercepting play, I work with these pressing triggers, a bad touch from the opponent or pass, the opponent receives back to goal, the opponent receives by the sideline, the uh, opposition is out of balance, a back pass from the opposition or pass between our defending players. These are something that should trigger everything in the players. These are something you have to remind them about every time you 
play a game that if something of this happens, it's just press, press, press. However, it's still, you can put all of, uh, all of these kind of triggers, but it's still also important to remind your players that you can't intercept the ball if you're not overloaded in the area. I mean, it doesn't matter to go in a press and if, say, a, a player uh, gets the ball with his back turned to goal, if they're not overloaded they, in the area or at least equal numbers, they will still have, find it hard to intercept the ball. Offensive transitions. Uh, we have, again here, to, we start to work with priorities. When we win the ball, can we attack the space and behind the defense? Can we attack in front of the defense? If not, we can combine out of the first pressure and then go into our possession phase. If we can't do that, just kick it out of the pitch. Um, if we then succeed with one of the two first options, we can, we then start to work with principles. What are we going to do? And that is according to the situation again. We want to run in angles with the ball. That way we can, instead of running straight, it's easier to tackle us and it's easier to track us. If we start to do angled runs, we can get across an opponent. opponent we will then either have to leave the player or have a high chance of committing a free kick. And also it will be harder for the player to, to, to track the run. If he should then do that, when a lot of runs away from the ball carrier, we want our wingers who should be very good dribblers to, on the ball to dribble a lot in our counter attacks. Fewer passes, more dribbles dribbles across the pitch and runs away from him to create space for him. If that's not possible, hopefully we can go in behind. And I would get here at least three players in rest defense also to keep the balance on the team. Now then, coming into system, uh, for me the system doesn't always matter that much because you can twist the system a lot, you can move a player's round and then it sort of becomes your own system. Uh, for example, I've written here that playing again against a team where we are inferior, I would often go for the 3-4-3. A lot of people would consider a 3-4-3 to be a very offensive uh, offensive uh, formation, but in this style of play it would be quite a defensive formation because you get another player uh, in the middle of the pitch and also another player behind the ball because I would personally take my two two of my strikers down behind. Uh, yeah, sorry, this is in Danish. Uh, this is the formation without the ball and this is with the ball. The same over here. And these are systems I would choose between according to like, when I have to decide upon my tactics as well because as I told you how I see tactics is that when you, there is something you there's some buttons you push or whatever you want to call it to win a game. I would pick one of these systems in order to win a game. For example, here it wouldn't be uh, as possible to win the ball by the sides uh, because they have, it has one less player in, in the side of the pitch, the, the 3 for 3 So that is some a thing that I want less of in this game, but I'll, but I'll turn up the volume in the central defending. That is how I choose between system and how I see the difference between style of play and tactics. So now I've given some of the uh, some of my ideas about the phases of play, but I also just want to mention two uh, quite valuable le lessons I've gotten recently. Uh, I'll start with this one. Uh, I went to my to do my UFB license uh, uh, last week. Uh, the Danish UFB license is set up the way so you do you have 24 people on the course. Uh, there come two teams come in. You you split the, the people on a bunch of coaching staff 12. Then one staff is with one team and one staff is the, with the other team. The, then you watch a game between. We, in our case, it was 214 teams, um, and then you are responsible for that team uh, during the week, and then they have to play another game. Uh, in the end of the week to see sort of how far you got them. So my team, the team that I'm in the coaching staff of, we watch the team play and they lose 8-0. Uh, so yeah, the coaching staff, of course, we look at each other and say, uh, okay, this is going to be quite a tough, uh, tough thing. So 
what we decided to do, like we could have gotten in, because you had one, uh, you had three uh, coaching sessions with them on one on defending, one on and the finalization play, and one on build up play. And then you could choose yourself in the last one what you wanted to do. Uh, so we could have gotten in and said, uh, we want to change everything because this just went, <laughs> I mean, this just wasn't good enough. But we decided upon that we had actually seen an expression in this team, we had seen a DNA in this team, and we wanted to build on that DNA instead of just tearing it all down. So we decided to go out and coach the things that they were trying to do, but did not do very well. Uh, and then we come Friday, uh, and also the, the day where we could have chosen, where we could choose the subject ourselves. A lot of coaches would maybe have chosen we go out to coach defending because we just called it lost eight no. Uh, no, we coached build up play because that's what they were good at. They were not a defending team, they were an attacking team. So we come out Friday, uh, 30 minutes gone, we're leading 5 0. Uh, that can also be because of the other team because they have just been walking around. Uh, we just won 8 0, we don't really need to, to do that much about this. Uh, we did end up winning 5 4 because they probably realized that they were not uh, very good and then took themselves together in the second half. But that was a very valuable lesson to me that. Even though I have a style of play, I don't need to just go in to my players when I step into a new club and say, this is how we do it. There's already some things there, and your style of play will develop through the, according to the experience you get. I would never go into a club and say, this is my style of play, now you just do that. You know, there's always something that has been before you, and probably something that has worked very well, that you need to also see if you can just do that better, and then <coughs> the team will also benefit from that. Here. At the box team, uh, also some very valuable lessons, I think, that mainly comes to the, these facts as I went through here. When we set upon what kind of football we wanted to play, a lot of these things, according to me, at least now two of the coaches are sitting in here, I think would probably say, say something else, so I don't know. But a lot of these things weren't taken into consideration. The facilities thing is we, we set out with what I would call quite an ambitious Start of play. We had uh, half a pitch for one and a half hour a week. That's not very much to train uh, to train something that's very new to the players. There was definitely also a culture uh, around the team that wasn't very patient in space. And in terms of build-up play, that was overseen by 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 us and the coaching staff. But definitely also the league. Uh, what things are you actually facing in the, the league? Because we we play very very good football when we play at home and play on AstroTurf. But we have played what three games on AstroTurf. We have won all three of them, but that is nearly also the only games we have won. Because when we go away, we play on mud. We don't play on AstroTurf, and that is also a valuable lesson for me that these things are not necessarily something that you can do something about yourself, but. They are just very, very important to, to remember. So, uh,